Okay, welcome back. Uh, today we are going to talk about non-parametric function approximators. So one of the reasons why it's called non-parametric is because in order to approximate the function, you don't need to have any, you, need, you don't need to make any assumption about the distribution of the underlying random variables xi and zi. So the idea here, as opposed to parametric function approximators, uh, if you recall from our previous class, is as follows. In the parametric approximator. You determine a set of parameters using some sort of least square minimization problem, and that defines uh, uh, the function uh, globally. Okay, so this is a linear regression problem. So we talked about a set of data points. So this is your xi, this is my zi. Okay, and there are a bunch of data points uh, like this, uh, refer to the previous lecture. And if you're doing a linear regression, you come up with a set of parameters theta, and that defines the function over the entire space of xi comma zi, x comma z, or x cross z. Uh, whereas uh, if you're doing a non-parametric regression, you kind of divide the region, the entire x. So you, this is your capital X, and you divide it into four regions. And you try to fit a completely different function in each of these regions. So here you fit a quadratic function. In this region you fit a linear function. Here you fit a inverse quadratic function. And in this region again you fit a linear function. Okay, so depending on different regions you fit a different function. And that gives you um, an approximation to the function from which the data actually came from. Okay, so one of the simplest form of non-parametric uh, uh, regression that you may have seen before, I'm pretty sure you have seen before, is linear interpolation. So consider this time series. So this is your time and you have some data points as a function of time and you want to interpolate this data point within each segment. What you end up doing is you join these points using linear curves and this is the linear interpolation and you can view it as a non-parametric regression because uh, you're trying to uh, fit a linear uh, function in between these two points so this is uh, let me put it in the blue color so this is your region 1, this is your region 2, region 3, region 4, region 5. And you are fitting a linear function in between these regions, which is merely a linear interpolation between the two points, the two endpoints. One thing you will notice is in this regression problem, in this regression problem, you have a function that is continuous, uh, piecewise continuous function. Whereas in this case, you have a continuous but piecewise differentiable function. And these things will be important as we talk about uh, uh, regression problems for reinforcement learning because uh, you don't want your value function. So remember, you are doing this regression problem purely to estimate or come up with a function um, uh, come up with an approximation to the value function and you don't necessarily want your value functions to have discontinuities of this sort. However, your policies could have discontinuities uh, as we have seen in the case of uh, house selling example which we uh, uh, which you had talked of, which you had uh, solved in the first assignment where the selling strategy of the uh, seller was to uh, sell the house if the price of the house or if the offer for the house is above certain threshold or do not sell the house and hold the offer uh, for a future time uh, if the offer is below certain threshold right so that threshold based strategy is a uh, the threshold based strategy is essentially a, a, a non-linear function because it looks like the strategy looks like something like this. So this is the threshold. This is your 
mu of x and this is your x where x was the offer in that example and mu of x was whether you want to sell which was u equals to 1 or whether you want to hold which is u equal to 0. Okay, so depending on the context you may want your value function to have some continuity property which you see here or in some cases or, or, and your the policy you may want to have continuity properties or you may want to you are fine with having discontinuity properties so when you are doing reinforcement learning you may want your you may want to pick an appropriate choice of regression function uh, depending on the application and whether you expect the value functions and policies to be continuous or not so there are essentially four paradigms in non parametric function approximation the first is called local averaging where you look at the neighborhood so you have a point x you look at the neighborhood of x you look at the points x1 x5 x100 x1000 which is in the neighborhood of this point x that you are interested in uh, who's, so you want to come up with the value of function fx uh, for the point x so you look at the neighborhood of x pick all the values xi's that belong to the neighborhood of x and then you sort of average the zi's at those points uh, in order to compute the uh, value of uh, f at x okay or estimate the value of f at x so that's the local averaging local modeling uh, allows you to go a bit more general than local averaging so you look at these local values but you don't necessarily fit a constant function you try to fit a uh, a, a non-constant polynomial kind of uh, function so this example is an example of local modeling where piecewise you fit a polynomial um, in the neighborhood then there are global modeling where you have a function class fn and you try to fit that fn globally uh, but then those functions can be piecewise discontinuous or piecewise continuous or you can have various <coughs> excuse me you can have various uh, assumptions on the uh, on the function um, that you are trying to estimate um, so piecewise continuity or piecewise discontinuities or piecewise differentiability are the concerns that, that you have to uh, think about when you're doing global modeling remember um, the parametric function approximator that we talked about in the previous class also had some global modeling property but you expected the same set of parameters to define the function everywhere whereas in the case of non parametric regression you expect the functions uh, you, you expect the parameters to take different values in different regions of the x space and then penalized modeling attempts to um, add certain constraints to the uh, uh, add certain constraints to the uh, function that you are trying to optimize so we'll talk a little bit about penalized modeling and we'll do spline interpol uh, spline uh, uh, regression uh, in order to understand better understand the idea of penalized modeling so with this uh, let's move on to local averaging uh, paradigm of uh, non parametric function approximation so let us talk about uh, let us talk about uh, local averaging um, so there are three types of uh, local averaging so par partitioning estimate this is also known as regression tree so i have to apologize here uh, in the previous class i talked about regression tree and i said that regression tree is a non parametric function approximator but it turns out after reading a lot about the differences between parametric and non parametric function approximator it turns out that regression trees are actually non parametric function approximators nonetheless we have learned the theory in the previous class uh, or learned the basic idea in the previous class so in this class we'll go a little bit deeper into how those trees are constructed uh, the second type of local averaging estimate is uh, uh, estimator is a Nadaraya Watson kernel estimator, which uses some sort of kernel function um, to uh, weigh the values of zi's depending on the distance between the point x at which you are interested in and point xi's that are in your data set. And then there is a nearest neighbor function approximator, and this is something you have done in assignment three. 
this was the last question. I think this was problem six. Uh, but it may be problem seven or problem six. It was the last question in that assignment. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's try and understand what the idea, basic idea is. So you have the state space, and <coughs> depending on the uh, uh, this is your space X and you want to uh, divide the state space into various regions and then you want to estimate the function uh, using the data points within these regions so that's the first idea the second idea is you have the state space X, you have a point X at which you are interested in and you have the other points that are well known and you try to weigh the value of ZI depending on the distance between X to each of these values. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the first part which is uh, partitioning estimate or regression trees. So as I mentioned earlier, partitioning estimate is same as regression tree. So the idea is you divide the state space X into multiple regions, AK, K equals one to capital K. Okay, and uh, of course uh, you can make AKs to be circular or uh, rectangular or some sort of uh, polygon, but uh, but typically, um, you know, in regression trees, you typically think of them as rectangles. So what I'm saying is in regression trees, the way we had talked about, you essentially divide the state space into rectangular regions. And uh, you make sure that the function is constant within this rectangular region. OK, so this is your A1, this is your A2, this is your A3, A4, A5, A6, A7. Okay, so the function f hat is constant, f hat of x is constant in each region, or not f hat of x, but f hat is constant in each region. Okay, so uh, what I want to talk about now is how do you construct the the regression tree so how do you know where to partition uh, these rectangles okay so let me uh, briefly show you uh, uh, how this is this is done so remember so i want to recall from the previous class so the regression tree in this case is you have a two dimensional system so x1 and x2 um, so x is equal to x1 and x2 and um, the way you define the regression tree is as follows. So you go through this uh, particular graph. So is x1 less than or equal to t1? Yes. Is x2 less than or equal to t2? Yes. Then the value is r1. If not, then the value is r2 and so on and so forth, right? So depending on the values of r1, r2, r3, r4, r5, which are the values uh, at the end of the, in the leaf node, um, you get a function which which looks something like this. So you can see it is piecewise constant, okay, in each of these regions, and it has uh, this is f hat of x. It is piecewise constant, and uh, there is a lot of discontinuities from one region to another. So how do you determine what the values of these t1, t2, and t3, all of these values should be? That's one of the question. And the other question is, what should the values of R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5 be? Okay, so so how to decide? So the question is, how to decide or compute T1 to T4 and R1 to R5. Of course, you can have far more number of thresholds and far more uh, values of uh, uh, the leaf nodes R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, um, depending on how many branches you have in this particular tree. So here is how you uh, do the uh, construct the regression tree. 
So given a point x i, uh, you define the set of all for every j and x bar j. So x bar j is a threshold, uh, which is this t threshold, and uh, j is the coordinate of x. Okay, so for every, so this is the data point. This is the jth jth uh, element of xi. So remember your data point is xi zi. This is what you are given. i equals 1 to, uh, what should I call it? Let me call it uh, m. Okay. So this is the data set that is given to you. And you want to come up with a function approximator which fits this particular data set. So xij is the jth coordinate of xi. x bar j is some threshold that you want to figure out. So this x bar j, optimal x bar j would become t1, t2, t3 and so on. So you divide the uh, all the coordinates into, for every coordinate and for every threshold, you, you come up with two different values of uh, uh, data points, so two different sets. So this is the set of all data points which satisfy this inequality. This is the set of all data points that satisfy the opposite inequality. Okay. And then you come up with the mean of zi uh, for all the i's in this particular region and you store it as this value c. And the same thing you do for mean of zi in this particular region and you store it as a value of c greater than 0. And then the goal is to minimize over all possible coordinate j and over all possible thresholds x bar j such as such that you minimize this whole sorry there should be a square here and there should not be any square here. So you want to minimize this overall uh, mean square error between x i between z i's and the constant values c i's that you have computed here. So this is where c i goes and this is where rj goes. So you're summing it over all z i's within this particular set of data points. Okay, now uh, I do agree that this is an extremely complicated problem because you're minimizing with respect to coordinates and with respect to thresholds and the thresholds depend on the way you uh, bin the data points. So uh, it's not like you can use a simple gradient descent type algorithm to compute this minimization. So therefore, you can only construct decision trees or regression trees uh, for a very small scale kind of problems. So two dimensional problems or three dimensional problems, but not more than that. So we'll talk about randomized function approximation in the next class and we'll see how people get around this difficulty um, of constructing decision trees that where you need to solve such complicated optimization problems. So I do agree at this point of time that it's not a feasible option for many of the reinforcement learning tasks that we would like to or we would be interested in. But nonetheless, this is an option that is available to us. Okay. So the kind of, uh, 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 so the kind of uh, function approximation you get is f hat of x is summation c i indicator function of x in a i. Oh, uh, uh, maybe I should use a k. c k indicator function of x in a k and k goes from 1 to capital K. Okay, so it's piecewise constant. So within each rectangular region, the function value is constant. Okay, that's the function approximator that uh, of course we studied it in the previous class but this class we talked about how you construct such a function oh uh, one thing that i perhaps forgot to mention so this uh, uh, this j so this uh, uh, so this this so the, there is you get a j star here as the argument and then you get a xj star j star and x bar j star okay you get the solution um, um, as part of this minimization problem 
So this J star is then used to here. So here you write X2. So this 2 is basically J star for this particular region. And X bar uh, uh, J star is this threshold T2 that you see here. Maybe I should draw them in a different color. So this J star is this 2 here. This X bar J star is this T2 value here. And this, this C bar less than equal to 0 and C bar greater than equal to 0. These are the values you see in R1 and R2. So, of course, you pick these values for J star and X bar J star in order to get the values of R1 and R2. So, that's how you define um, these thresholds and these um, uh, values at each of these different points. So, unfortunately, there is a lot of notational problems here because I'm picking uh, figures from different books and um, and everyone uses different notations for explaining things within their book but um, but overall uh, what I want to emphasize is you get a piecewise constant function uh, so in each region the function is constant and the way to determine these constants as well as which coordinates to split and how do you do that um, you you use this kind of uh, optimization algorithm to compute that. So there are obvious problems with this sort of function approximator. So let's talk about the other possibility which is called Nadaraya Watson kernel estimate. And the idea is uh, now this is different from RKHS. So I don't want you to confuse between the two kernels. So this is different from the kernel used in RKHS. Okay. Uh, so the problem is as follows. Uh, let's say you have two points that are very far apart. Okay. So this is your x at which you are interested in. This is x1 and this is x2 and it has a value z1 and it has a value z2. And you want to estimate the value at x, estimate the value of the function at x. So, you may want to argue that since x is closer to x1, the value at x will have a larger influence of G1, z1 and less influence of z2. So, let me write it since x is closer to x1, f hat x should have a large influence from z1 okay and less influence from z2 so how do you do that how do you come up with a, a function approximator of this type so what you do is you somehow weigh the value of zi's using what is known as the nadaraya watson kernels so the idea is I want to compute the value of f hat x by um, I want to compute the value of f hat x by um, the following method. So I want to do summation of i equals 1 to m. This is the kernel k norm of x minus xi over h into z i over summation i equals 1 to m k of norm of x minus x i over h. Okay, so h is some parameter, h is known as bandwidth 
of the kernel and this is basically a weighing uh, you are weighing based on the distance you are coming up with some weights for zi and then you are taking the average um, in order to compute the value of f hat x okay so what are the different kernels that are commonly used so one of the kernel is this is a window kernel window kernel then you have a gaussian kernel so this kx is norm uh, i indicator function of norm of x less than equal to 1 or you can put any other threshold here uh, then the second type of kernel is the gaussian kernel okay so this is just uh, e raised to minus x square so points that are very far off from x will have very negligible effect on the value of the function and then the uh, third kind of function is uh, Ipanishnikov kernel, which is given by this complicated expression, um, and uh, uh, this is of course the Gaussian kernel that we have already seen before. Okay, so these are the three normal three uh, kernels used for Nadaraya Watson kernel estimate, and the function approximator has this particular form. So you pick whatever kernel you like, um, and then you estimate the value of f hat x f hat at x by uh, computing this uh, weighted mean of the uh, of the values of zi hmm. now let's talk about k nearest neighbor estimate uh, which this is something that you have done already in assignment so i'll just go over it very quickly so what you do is you have these uh, xi zi i equals 1 to m you want to find the value of uh, f hat x so the way you do that is you find out neighbors of x k neighbors of x so you arrange these data points in the following fashion so you um, uh, let i1 i2 i m be the set of indices such that x minus x i1 is less than equal to x minus x i2 is less than equal to so on okay and uh, and then you so you identify the k neighbors so you pick only the k neighbors and then you define f hat of x as 1 over k summation i j equals to 1 to k z i j okay so let's show you a picture so this is my x this is x1 this is x2, this is x3, this is x4. Okay, so we know that x minus x2 is less than equal to x minus x1 is less than equal to x minus x3 is less than equal to x minus x4. And I, I'm just interested in two, two nearest neighbor, so 2nn estimator then my f hat of x will be z2 plus z1 over 2 okay so this is my two nearest neighbor estimator if i want three nearest neighbor estimator then my f hat x will be z2 plus z1 plus z3 over 3 Okay, so that's how you compute the k nearest neighbor estimator, and uh, that's one of the uh, local averaging type non parametric function approximator. So that ends our discussion on local averaging. Let's talk about local modeling type function approximator. So the idea in local modeling is very simple uh, you want to uh, use the Nadaraya Watson kernel estimator. So use Nadaraya 
what's an estimator with some polynomial uh, with some polynomial type approximator okay so let's think about it So you want to compute uh, uh, so let me call the uh, phi of x theta theta 0 uh, plus theta 1 x raised to 1 plus theta 2 x raised to 2 Okay, so just in a case where x is a, a, a one-dimensional object, but of course you can have situation where x is multi-dimensional, so you will have to add more basis functions to this particular function phi. And then you do the following. The goal here is to find theta as a function of x. Okay, so that you can uh, compute the polynomial approximation uh, for the value of function f hat uh, at x. <coughs> so how do you find theta of x? It's the argument of theta, in this case it's r3, of 1 over m so you have remember you have m uh, different uh, you have m different data points summation i equals 1 to m k of x minus xi norm over h zi minus phi of xi theta Uh, square okay so every time you solve this minimization problem uh, in order to compute the value of theta star of x and then your um, function f hat of x is given by theta star of x uh, sorry phi of x theta star of x now of course uh, i am doing a polynomial here but you could as well do theta naught plus theta 1 log of x plus theta 2 e raised to x or you can pick any other basis functions you like uh, but typically polynomial is what is generally used in the uh, in the usual situation in the usual scenarios um, so this is known as local modeling because you somehow look at the fun the points x i s that are near to x and then you weigh the values of theta appropriately in order to compute the uh, the value of function uh, at at point x okay so remember in the case of parametric regression i want to contrast this with parametric regression so in parametric regression your f hat of x was given by phi of x and theta star Okay, so theta star didn't depend on x, whereas in the case of non-parametric regression, it depends on x. And remember that once you fix x, then this is uh, uh, this is just uh, uh, this is the weight. So x is fixed, x i s are known, h is fixed. So this is just a constant, which is a weight. And z i minus phi of x i comma theta square. Uh, this is the term. This is the least square estimation problem. And this is uh, something that we had studied in the context of parametric regression, right? So, um, uh, so this is just the vanilla uh, square norm, uh, sorry, square minimization. But now you are adding a weight to this uh, square function, and that makes it a non-parametric regressor. In the case of parametric regression, this weight was always equal to 1, so you were only minimizing sum of zi minus phi of 
xi comma theta square in order to find the value of theta star okay so in parametric regression k was equal to 1 okay so so that's the local modeling part in the global modeling part um, you have you define some sort of functions f a uh, function class f which depends on uh, which is also parameterized in a in a very uh, uh, let me let's talk about global modeling now in this case what you do is remember the regression tree that we were talking about so you divide the space into different regions and you have a1 a2 a3 a4 a5 a6 okay so in the case of local modeling in regression trees my f of x f hat of x was summation of ck indicator function x in ak k equals 1 to capital k where capital k is the number of uh, regions that you have divided your state space x into so in the case of uh, global modeling what you do is you come up with a more general function so your f the function class is the set of all function f such that f of x is equal to summation k equals 1 to capital k v of x theta uh, theta k and indicator function x in a k okay so this is so this is how you define your function globally so remember in the case of regression tree this was this function was actually a constant function so that's why you had ck there whereas now you expect this function to be a more general function so it could be a linear function quadratic function uh, or some other nonlinear function and that's how you define the class of all functions f okay somehow the regions are already decided in this situation of course you might argue how do you decide the region uh, so there are of course algorithm which will do the optimization over both theta as well as the regions ak so so what's the optimization problem here well you want your function f hat to be argmin of f in this uh, region capital uh, this space of functions f uh, such that you are minimizing some 1 over m summation i equals 1 to m norm of zi minus f xi square okay so uh, so this is your global modeling uh, part and the kind of function you can get so in the regression tree you had like piecewise constant function so here you can get a piecewise uh, um, uh, piecewise uh, smooth function so you can get something like I need to draw the boundaries so this is one dimensional x and you get a function that is piecewise looks like this okay so this is the kind of function approximator instead of a piecewise constant now you get a piecewise uh, polynomial or a piecewise smooth function because uh, depending on how you define your functions phi to be okay so this is uh, a1 a2 a3 a4 and this is your phi of x theta 4 star phi of x theta 3 star and so on so this gives you global modeling and one of the obvious problems with global modeling is that at these points the function is discontinuous um, and that may be a problem for in some situation so definitely for the case of reinforcement learning this is a problem we don't want our value functions to be discontinuous especially if it is a physical system 
because in physical system because the you know like a robotic system or a, a vehicle running on the road there are so many mechanical linkages that uh, value functions being discontinuous uh, may be uh, uh, not possible so you may have discontinuity at fe infeasible situations but if you are within the feasible region of your feasible region of your physical system uh, you won't have discontinuities in the value functions or at least that's what we expect to uh, or we hope to have so that's why this is a problem this kind of global modeling situation is a problem so to um, alleviate this problem there is something called penalized modeling paradigm where you use the function approximator approximating class f but then you add some penalty term for this on the smoothness of the function f so let's look at penalized modeling so we talked about so we talked about the function class f of global modeling and we learned that that f hat could be could have discontinuities okay so um, the so 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 you want to get rid of this discontinuity so what you do is you um, you add a penalty term so you do the minimization or you have f hat equals to argmin f in capital f um, 1 over m summation zi minus f of xi square i equals 1 to m plus some uh, some penalty let me write it as penalty on f okay so what kind of penalty functions can you have so one of the most common penalty function is uh, known as the uh, second so you basically penalize the second derivative so it's uh, some constant lambda times integral over the entire space x of f double prime of x dx or maybe square okay so you want the function to be at least twice uh, differentiable this is this is twice differentiable del 2f over del x square okay now if you have a function f of multiple variables then you can have penalty that is uh, far more complicated uh, so let's say you had functions of two variables then your penalty would be lambda times integral over x gradient of x1 square f plus x1 x2 f plus gradient of x2 square f dx okay so this is just uh, uh so 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 you you put the uh second derivative along every direction and then you also take the second derivative of the cross uh, like derivative with respect to x2 and then derivative with respect to x1 and then you penalize that as well so i probably need to square it and that's how you uh uh, you penalize functions of multiple dimensions so of course in the multiple dimensional case this will become a very complicated uh, penalty function but for functions of single variable this is sort of well understood <clears throat> so that's the uh, idea of penalized modeling so in penalized modeling what you do is you have a function class and um, which may be piecewise uh, piecewise polynomial but then you add a penalty on f and the penalty is in the form of maybe second derivative has to be second derivative has to exist and at all the points which means that you cannot not have discontinuities anymore okay so so in the case of uh, uh, let's say again the linear region so 
you divide your entire space x into multiple regions and then you define a function that looks like this now you cannot in the case of uh, the global modeling you could have some discontinuity here but now you want your second derivative to exist at all points so this function has to start here and perhaps end here and then again it cannot have discontinuities here it has to be second differentiable okay so now you get a very nice and smooth well it's not smooth it's not infinitely differentiable but it's at least twice differentiable which is uh, which is very good okay and you get uh, uh, regression this is your f hat of x uh, for this uh, particular problem uh, for this given set of data points okay so this is uh, known as penalized modeling so one of the most uh, common penalized modeling for one dimension is known as splines so splines is you you have this space you divide it into regions uh, this is u0 u1 u2 this is your a1 this is your a2 and you want your uh, polynomials to and and what you want to do is you want to fit a polynomial p p1 of x well i have used phi so let me try to continue using phi x theta 1 p x theta 2 and so on so each of these phi functions are polynomial so phi of x theta is theta 0 x raised to 0 plus theta 1 x raised to 1 plus theta 2 x raised to 2 plus so on so these are polynomials of degree m okay well capital m okay so these are known as uh, uh, and if they are all smooth uh, like if they are all uh, twice differentiable at each of these points u1 and u2 and so on then these are known as splines so you define the space of splines in the following fashion so let m be so remember m is the diff the polynomials of degree m that you're picking so m be in n0 which is you could be um, uh, any so m has to be a natural number and let u0 u1 u2 all the way up to uk uh, be given okay so so your x is u0 to uk capital k okay and your ak is u k minus 1 to uk okay then set u u is uh, just the sequence uj so these are the points at which you you have broken the region uh, we define the spline space so this is known as spline space as follows so these are the these are the functions f from u0 to uk to r so this is your x such that there exist polynomials p0 all the way up to pk minus 1 so these are the same as phi of x theta again because i'm using a different book for every um, th every uh, uh, section uh, we have completely different notation so uh, bear with me so these are there exist polynomials of degree m or less such that fx is equal to pi of x uh, for all x in ak so this is your a a i plus 1 so your fx is equal to pi x for all x in a i plus 1 and if m minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0 then f is m minus 1 continuously differentiable in the entire interval capital x okay so u is known as the not vector and m is called the degree of the spline space okay so each polynomial is of degree m and the function f is m minus 1 times continuously differentiable over the entire space x so this is known as the spline space again i want to show you the how the function looks like so these are all the functions that are piecewise polynomial and uh, 
uh, at ev each of these points it is at least n minus 1 differentiable of course in this region it is infinitely differentiable because it's a polynomial but it's only at the knots where uh, you could have a non differentiable situation so you want to make sure that uh, at those points the function is at least n minus 1 continuously differentiable okay uh, one of the simplest uh, uh, regression function in this case is when you have a time series and you do a linear uh, linear interpolation so you have these uh, these time series and what you do is you do a linear interpolation between these values so this is a regression which is a uh, it's a spline because you're using a polynomials of degree one in order to uh, estimate the function in between these two points and uh, at each of these points so these are the knots these are the knots and at each of these points the function is not differentiable because the derivative the left derivative is not equal to the right derivative and therefore it's not uh, differentiable but nonetheless it is continuous so it is continuous but not differentiable at knots all right so this is known as a spline space it turns out that this sum can actually be parameterized in this way so sum of u0 to uk uk is equal to the set of all functions that are given by uh, by uh, polynomials of degree m which spans over the entire space and then this is max of 0 x minus u j raised to m okay so now you have m plus 1 parameters here you have k minus 1 parameters here so you have a total of theta is in r capital m plus capital k and theta is given by a0 to am and b1 to b capital k minus 1 okay so uh, now given xi's and zi's you can uh, evaluate f of x i s and then you can use a usual least square estimation to find the value of theta star that would uh, uh, that would fit the function over the entire space okay all right so it's, this is splines in one dimension how do you extend this idea to splines in multiple dimension well the first idea is you have your let's say your x is in rn x is a subset of rn so one idea is to have f hat of x as summation f hat j of xj j equals 1 to n so for every dimension you come up with a spline um, uh, interpolation and then you sum it all up in order to get the value of f hat okay that's idea number one so you are separable sum of one dimensional splines the second idea is well i'm going to take sum of one or two dimensional splines so the idea here is i will let f hat of x is equal to f hat one of x1 x5 plus f hat 2 of x2 plus f hat 3 of x4 x5 plus f hat 4 of x3 x1 plus f hat 5 of i have used 1 2 3 4 5 whatever x6 okay so you kind of uh, come up with one or two dimensional splines and then you add it all up in order to estimate the function f hat so this is uh, uh, the second second idea uh, for extending the splines to multiple dimensional situations uh, space and then the third idea is i define f hat of x as summation of uh, j not j 
yeah maybe j equals to 1 to capital j f hat j of alpha j transpose x okay so you project x onto different uh, alpha 1 alpha 2 okay and then you do the spline regression along those directions so this is your state space capital x this is your alpha 1 this is your alpha 2 you have a point x you project it onto alpha 1 x you project it onto alpha 2 sorry you project it onto alpha 1 you project it onto alpha 2 and then you do the spline regression along this direction and a spline regression along that direction add it all up um, and you get the value of f hat so in this case not only you have to optimize the uh, coefficients of the polynomials of f hat j but you also have to um, optimize the values of alpha j so again there are algorithms available that can optimize for both of these things but naturally this is a non-convex optimization problem so you can only get to a local minimum uh, so that's all i have for uh, non-parametric function approximators uh, uh, there are quite a few different types of non-parametric function approximators that we test upon today and in the next class, what we are going to study is randomized function approximators, which is another very important topic. So, uh, which has been which has been very successful in the recent past. So, in the randomized function approximators, we are going to talk about boosting and random forest, and then we are talk, going to talk about what are the problems with high dimensional state spaces. We are going to talk about bagging. Uh, and then we're going to talk about transition probability estimators and we'll have some concluding discussions and thoughts. So that's all for now. Um, I, I'll see you in the next class. Well, I won't see you, but I'll talk to you in the next class.